it's great to be back. Um, thanks for coming. I, I uh, was sitting here thinking, well, what am I going to say when I start? Because last time I was here, I told the best joke, but I don't want to say it at the second time because you know, you know it's all wrong. And then I thought, well, I can not repeat myself. <clears throat> so it's not really a joke. It's just something that happened when I was <clears throat> working on the Rose Ideology of Oregon book. I, um, my friend Virginia accompanied me on a lot of field trips and um, and we had such a different style. In fact, I, I hope if you get a chance to look at the books, you look at the acknowledgments because they're kind of the best part of the book. But because um, I had a lot of help. But um, Virginia was like super calm. And I'm always amped up and having a third end. And, and she would want to like stop and do things like look at flowers and, you know. <laughs> There are rocks to look at, and why would you stop with the flowers? But anyways, and she, one time she actually put the car in first, backed up to look at some flowers. I didn't believe that. But um, we we were, I was usually had my usual agenda going. We pulled into a uh, parking lot in, in, in Burns, Oregon, and she was driving. And you know, we needed gas to go on with me, stop being able to get gas because we needed gas. Yeah. And, um, she pulled into the parking lot a little too slowly, but it's okay. And you know, they start pumping gas, and fine, okay, we need to gas. But then she says, I think I'll, I think I'll wash the windshield. And I'm like, okay, fine, because they're still pumping gas. So she gets out there and she starts walking. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, they're still pumping gas. <laughs> and it's just still washing. And then it clicks off. And then it's like time to go. But she's still washing the windshield. And finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, it looks great. And she said, I think I'll wash the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're even better that's because of that. So, um, I, I probably should stop telling wall stories or I'll lose all credibility. So let's maybe move on to the slides. Um, I'm sure you all know we've got some pretty awesome landscapes here in Oregon and Washington. This is Bamden Beach um, at low tide. You can go out and, and, and check out the sea stacks. Um, we've got the um, Cascade Volcanoes, which run all the way from Lassen Peak in Northern California up to Southern British Columbia. And then here's a view looking over uh, Mount St. Helens towards Mount Rainier. And here in Oregon, we've got the three sisters there and there's uh, Mount Bachelor and, and Broken Top, you know, along with the whole other slew of um, volcanoes, including Mount Hood right here. Um, if you go up to Northern Washington State, you can get up into the North Cascades range, which are all together different mountains. They're, they're not, by and large, um, volcanoes. They're um, um, igneous and metamorphic rock that has come up from pretty great depths and uh, is now being eroded by these glaciers that you can see. Uh, if you go east of the Cascades, you get in the much drier country. This is looking into the Yakima Valley. Uh, here in Washington, and um, if you uh, go down into southern Oregon, you can get into these great desert landscapes um, in the basin and range. This is um, Alver Desert, which periodically floods, and then it dries up and leaves behind these great mud cracks. Um, so there's really awesome landscape, and it, the USGS has got these great physiographic maps you can just stare at for a while. Um, and it's um, they they lend themselves really nicely to these you know sort of field guidey kind of books because you know you can take individual areas and you know those that makes a chapter and then you can write a little introduction to the chapter and then the individual roads here would be um, you know the individual road guide. So that's the the physiography. But the, the physiography is really largely dependent on the geology. 
And so here's a geologic prospect of the systematic across Washington State. And it's pretty complicated, but the main thing to draw your attention to is this heavy dashed red line because it separates the, the basement rock down below from the, um, the cover sequence up above. And before I really get into it, um, well, let me say what I'm going to be talking about here first. I'm going to skip around in the basement a little bit to start. I'll talk a little bit about Silesia um, and then move over to uh, talk about um, the, the margin here with North America and this um, big accreted terrain here called Quinellia. And talk a little bit about the, um, the Western North Cascades. And, um, and that'll is kind of nice because it kind of lends itself to talking about the cover as well. And um, then to talk about the cover sequence, talk a, a little bit about the Columbia River Gorge. And as I said to somebody earlier tonight, I'm sure there's people in here who know a lot more about the Columbia Gorge than I do. So feel free to chime in or anything like that if you have something to add. So before we go on, just to make sure everybody's on the same page as far as plate tectonics, okay? Because plate tectonics is a huge thing when we talk about geology of the Pacific Northwest. Um, the, the idea of plate tectonics, the Earth's outer shell, as most of you know, is you know, made of the lithosphere, which uh, is broken into these big fragments called plates. And as the plates move around, they uh, can cause volcanic activity, um, mountain building, faulting, uh, things like that. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we've got um, these three plates, the Pacific plate in yellow, the one, the Fuqua plate, here in blue, and the North American plate. And so the next slide is a, a close-up of that area. And so here's the Pacific plate, now it's gray, and it's pulling away from the Juan de Fuqua plate right here. And the Juan de Fuqua plate is sinking or subducting underneath the North American plate here at the Cascadian subduction zone. And we've got the Cascade volcanoes here making a line that's parallel to the, the subduction zone. And so the next slide here then is um, um, a block diagram showing the, uh, and here are the Cascade volcanoes making their line. Okay, so you can see the um, Cascade volcanoes here making the line, here they are. And so uh, what's happening then is the Juan de Fuca plate is sinking or subducting underneath the North American plate. And as it sinks, it heats up, which causes it to dehydrate. And then you get water driven off into the overlying um, continental plate here. And that causes melting in the, the continental plate, which then is liquid rock, magma, it rises and it fuels the volcanoes here. So that's why they make this line parallel to the subduction zone. Well, that's going on today, but as it turns out, this has been going on a long, long time um, in the Pacific Northwest. You know, we've got, um, here are cascade volcanoes, um, but if you think about these volcanoes, they're being fueled by magma from below and, not all that magma makes it up to the surface. A lot of it cools and crystallizes beneath the surface as an intrusive igneous rock, which you have here. Um, and, you know, granite, for example, is an intrusive igneous rock. And we've got granites that are related to the subduction. We see them, you know, we see them in the Klamath Mountains. We see them in the Blue Mountains. We see them up in the Okanagan and the North Cascades. And some of these get to be older than say 140 million years old. So we know that this process has been going on for a long time. But also um, it, it, it explains how the continent grows. And, and if you imagine here, like this upper diagram, the oceanic lithosphere subducting underneath North America, if it's carrying with it, say an island arc complex or a big oceanic plateau or something like that, when it gets into the subduction zone, it, it, it's going to jam it up. But you've got, still got those two plates converging, and eventually then it's going to break. And in breaking, this body gets added onto or accreted onto the edge of the continent. 
And so if you compare, well, if you think about through time, another one coming in, then you can get another one of these so-called terrains added onto the continent as well. You can have a whole sequence of those. So if you look back at this cross section, you, here's North America. You've had accreted terrains here, Quinellia, the terrains of the North Cascades added after that. And finally, Silesia was added. And you see this pretty much the same thing in Oregon. Um, there, you can see these cross sections are really similar. Um, all these accreted terrains added onto North America. And after the accreted terrains were added, then you've got material that was erupted or deposited over the top uh, to make up the cover sequence. So to talk about Silesia here, uh, one of the hallmarks of Silesia and um, are, are these things, these are pillow basalts. Uh, and, you know, if you're not familiar with pillow basalts, they're pretty awesome. They're these rounded blobs of basalt and, and they, they erupt on the seafloor. Um, and you can imagine a, a, a submarine vent, for example, expelling blobs of lava, which then interacts with the, the cold seawater and it causes it to freeze on the outside, but it's still kind of malleable and soft on the inside. It it's settles on the seafloor and then another one comes and settles on top. So then they kind of conform in shape here with the underlying one. And, and then you get a whole stack of these, whole stack of these pillows. And here's a, a cross-sectional view of some pillows on Mary's Peak. You can see this radial fractures here because it's cooling from the outside inward. Um, and on this geologic map, you can see the, 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 the general um, distribution of Silesia, wherever you have purple. So down here at Roseburg, you've got exposures of Silesia, Silesia, Silesia. So here's Mary's Peak behind Corvallis. You can see Silesia up here, wherever there's purple. It goes all the way up to Northern Washington State. And in fact, on the Southern Vancouver Island, it's this huge, huge accreted terrain. And these rocks uh, formed between about 51 and 56 million years ago. And then it was all accreted uh, between about 51 to 49 million years ago. So after it was accreted, then you've got more sediment deposit over the top or volcanic material. Uh, and so that's what all these other colors are on the geologic map. So if I were to drill a hole, say like right here and drill downwards, I would drill down through these sedimentary rocks and then into the basement of Silesia. If you go up to uh, the Northern tip of the uh, Olympic Peninsula up here, um, to like Olympic National Park, you can drive the Hurricane Ridge Road, which is right here. And it crosses this sort of band, kind of make a, makes a horseshoe here of um, Silesia. And you can drive along the road. There's lots of pullouts, get out and pet the pillows. Um, they're very cool. Um, and, and then you can drive on all the way into the core of the Olympics and, and, and you know, wave at Mount Olympus and, and see some of the rocks up there. There are these low grade metamorphic rocks. Um, and you're in the Olympic core here, which is collectively called uh, the Olympic subduction, co subduction complex. So all this is part of this Olympic subduction complex. This is stuff that's been basically scraped off the descending plate. So it's material that was came together in a subduction zone. So you'd expect it to be really variable, and it is. So if you were to drive down the road down here and look at some of these beaches all along here, you can get a sense for just how variable it is. Um, this is its second beach. Um, if, you know, beautiful landscape down there, all these incredible coastal features. Um, but if you look at the rocks, you can see there are these, um, there are all these broken up pieces of sandstone in here, but then here's this piece of limestone stuck in the middle. Um, these are um, most likely submarine debris flows. If you go to uh, Ruby Beach, you can see more submarine debris flows, um, but these have pieces of basalt um, in them. They're probably part of Silesia. 
If you go to um, Beach 4, you can see sandstones and shales. So it's really variable, but it also, it's also like you might expect in a subduction zone, really deformed too. So these things are tilted up on end, you can see. But actually, if you look at the rock closely, you can see that there are graded beds in these rocks. And so they're coarser grained here and they get finer and finer grain in this direction. And then there's another coarse bed and finer and finer in this direction. So they get younger actually as you go downward. So these things have been overturned. And if you go around the corner, you can see this where um, these you know, rocks have been folded and they're sliding over or they slid over a fault. I don't know if they're still sliding over a fault, but um, they certainly slid <laughs> over a fault. Uh, so there, it's really highly deformed. And so variable and deformed, just kind of the, what you might expect. Um, and so this map then shows uh, all the accreted terrains on the west coast of North America. And, and th those are shown in the colors and the gray is Paleozoic North America, the edge of the Laurentian margin. And you can see um, here is, um, here's Oregon, here's Washington, here's Silesia in purple, and here's the Olympic subduction complex. And you'll notice that Oregon doesn't have any of the Paleozoic North America on it. It's all accreted terrains. In fact, the Oregon has the shortest geologic history of any state in the conterminous US, which I just think is amazing. Uh, you can go to Florida and the basement there is, is pre-Cambrian in age. So Oregon has, doesn't have any pre-Cambrian basement. It's off the edge of North America. But Washington here is mostly that way, except a little bit of um, Paleozoic North America is in Northeastern Washington. But that kind of raises the question, how do you know if you're on Paleozoic North America or on an accreted terrain? And well, a lot of the times you don't know because you're up in the cover, but when you can see the basement, there are some things that can clue you in. And as a great example, you can go to the Grand Canyon, for example, which we know is on Paleozoic North America. And here we can see Cambrian age sandstone, shale and limestone, which was deposited when the ocean was moving up onto the continent during the Cambrian period. So this is like 500 million years ago. And we can see the same sequence of rock all over the West. I mean, you can see it in Utah, you can see it in Montana, you can see it in Wyoming, you can see it in Colorado. I taught for three years in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and you can see it there. And, and so that's typical of Western North America. But you don't see that on any of the accreted terrains because they weren't a part of North America when they were during the Cambrian period, they were somewhere else. So you don't see the sequence um, in, on the accreted terrains. So if you go up here to Northeastern Washington, and you go to this place, Sweet Creek Falls, which I always really liked because every time I was up there, it was really hot. And I'd park the car and within a quarter mile, I could be in this beautiful lush forest and there was water and it was cool and there were great rocks. And, um, <clears throat> and you can see these cobbles here. These are Cambrian aged Addy quartzite, which used to be Cambrian sandstone. And they came from upstream and upstream, there are ledges of these things, and they're overlain by Cambrian shale, overlain by Cambrian limestone. And then this stuff here is um, Ordovician age, um, lead better slate, which used to be shale. So it, the whole sequence is, is up there. Um, so this was definitely part of North America during the Cambrian. And that, picture was taken right about here. Um, and so you can hop on uh, Washington State 20 and you can go from North America, follow that, go across Quinellia, keep following that, go across the North Cascades and over here, take the ferry across to Silesia. And so just on Washington State 20, which I think is one of my very favorite roads, you can start on North America and go all the way across and sample the, the cover as, as you're going. Um, and in the North Cascades, just to 
quick little diversion here, you cross this thing called the Straight Creek Fault. And the Straight Creek Fault separates the Cascades Crystalline Core from the Northwest Cascades Thrust System. And I had the privilege of advising one of the uh, young women in the, in the uh, audience today, tonight, um, who did her thesis up there. Uh, Addison worked on Mount, near Mount Shuxon, and this is the location where you see both Mount Baker and Mount Shuxon. And just to give you a, a brief kind of introduction to some of the things she did, because it's also really illustrative too of, of kind of where we're headed into the cover. Um, it's for one thing, it's a beautiful place. This is Mount Shuxon. Um, and she worked here on uh, Shuxon Arm. Um, and Shuxon Arm is just a wild place because it's got all these accreted terrains exposed on Shucks and Arm. You've got the Chilliwack terrain here. Um, then there's this fault zone, this stuff called the Bell Pass Melange, and, um, and then the, the Shucks and Thrust. And one of the things she did was relocate. So this is an old diagram I made for a, a little grant proposal. And she figured out that it actually isn't there. It's back behind here, but this, so this is an old diagram. One of the things Addison did was relocate the thrust. Here she is and her field assistant, Seisha, we're hiking to, to find where the thrust actually is. Um, and so it turned out it was around the bend here, just such an amazing place to work. Um, and so one of the, besides the fact that you gave us a chance to really look at some of these accreted terrains and all that, there is Mount Baker the whole time. And, you know, Mount Baker is, it's a volcano that has come up through the North Cascades through these accreted terrains. So while we're looking at rocks like this, this is part of the Bell Pass Melange, uh, you've got Mount Baker here, which basically has come up through those and erupted over the top. So while we're looking at the basement here, this is also cover. This now is cover that has come up and covers a lot of the basement. I think we could have found more stuff if you could just remove Mount Baker and look underneath. <laughs> That's not possible. <clears throat> so anyway, on to the cover then. Um, then in the Columbia River Gorge, here we are in Portland, um, and I outlined it with two yellow lines here from here to the Dalles, because one of the great things about it is you can go up, you know, Interstate um, um, 80 um, up to the Dalles, or, and then you can come back on Washington State 14 or do it the other way. It just makes a great field trip. Um, and I'll be kind of skipping around, just kind of back and forth, pointing out some things. So as I go up to try to make it at least a semi-coherent story. And this is two maps. This isn't the Columbia River. It's not that wide. There's actually two Columbia Rivers here. Um, and so this is a map from the Roadside Geology of Oregon book. And this is from Washington. And um, just to kind of give you a sense of just how variable the geology is, and to kind of simplify it, I just kind of highlighted some of what some of the colors meant. Um, you can see lots of landslides and river and flood sediment in yellow. There's the stuff called the Troutdale Formation, which I'll be talking about a little bit. Um, there's, of course, Cascades Range lavas and things, like including Mount Hood down here. There are the boring volcanics and magenta color. There's even some granitic rocks up here. There's lots of Columbia River basalt. And then there's even older uh, volcanic rocks that are related to the, the um, Cascades. And that's still kind of like, all right, well, there's a whole lot of rocks. But so the, the few points I want to make uh, is that we see this volcanic activity in the gorge. It, it goes back to the earliest Cascades. Um, and there's just a whole sequence of great volcanic rocks. Um, we can see, I mean, there's lots of reasons. We know that the Columbia River is a pretty old river. It dates back um, well into uh, um, Columbia River basalt times, um, but there's some real kind of interesting direct evidence that it's at least 12 million years old up the gorge that I, I, I like to um, talk about. And that we see that the bedrock structure really influences the shape of the gorge. That is basically the the dip of the beds in the, in the volcanic rocks. 
and uh, or the dip of the lava flows. And of course, it's a great place um, to, to look at some evidence for the Ice Age floods, which I'd like to point out. Scott Burns here is the person who really got me excited about the Ice Age floods for the first time. He gave a talk at University of Oregon, and oh my God, it just took everybody's breath away. So here we are heading up the gorge, and you can choose which road you want to take, I-84 um, or Washington State 14, which is certainly a calmer um, way to go. I have lots of pullouts along Washington 14. It's also a really fast road. You don't drive underneath all the cliffs and everything, uh, and that relates to the shape of the gorge, but uh, it's a really great driver. So you could just go, you know, counterclockwise or clockwise, however you want to do it. But there's Mount Hood. So, you know, we can kind of dispense with that. That's active volcanic activity. <laughs> I know some people have spent their whole career on Mount Hood and I said we could just dispense with it. But no, it's a great mountain. Um, but um, what I really want you to see is this here. This is Larch Mountain, which is a big uh, basaltic shield volcano. And it's part of the Boring Volcanics, um, which um, erupted from about 2.7 million years ago to 57,000 years ago. So this map from Everts et al. Um, shows the distribution of the Boring Volcanics. And it shows where Boring is right here, the town of Boring. Um, which I've been to and stopped at the bakery. Um, but the colors indicate different ages of the, the volcanic rocks. They're almost all basalt, lots of lava flows, lots of cinder cones, and some shield volcanoes. Um, and they're really an interesting thing. And I can't claim to know a whole lot about them, um, except certainly here in uh, Portland, they really dominate the landscape. All these buttes and everything, uh, they're either made of boring volcanics or they're cored by boring volcanics. Um, and, and, you know, there are these recently erupted volcanoes in an urban area. So they're, um, they're considered a potential hazard. I mean, if you think how many eruptions there have been in the last 2.7 million years, um, it, it seems like on a geological time scale, they're bound to continue erupting. So um, I think there a, a lot of people are very interested in them and the potential for um, possible future eruptions. They're also interesting because they're they're not on the, the axis of the Cascade volcanoes. They're over here on west off the axis. And so there's a lot of questions about why they actually have, why they even exist. Why are they here in the Portland area and not, uh, in the Cascades themselves. Um, I was talking a little bit about that uh, today at dinner with Sheila. And, you know, one possible explanation might be because of this rotation of, of Western Oregon um, around the pole at, located near Pendleton, which is about one degree every million years. But that's enough to cause the crust here to fracture and might allow material to, to come up to the surface. Um, there's ongoing research on this. And Beacon Rock here is the most recent of the um, boring volcanics. It's 57,000 years old. And um, <clears throat> you can go up to the top. There's basically a stairway that goes all the way up and you can get nice views of the Columbia River. Um, and also you can see back here these hills, which are mostly older volcanic rocks, and they include the Columbia River basalt group, which once you get up in the gorge, that is what you're looking at uh, largely. Everything in this photograph is Columbia River basalt group, and it's just amazing. I, I mean, you can look at a single lava flow and just trace it forever. Um, and these things, you know, they originated, most of them originated in uh, Eastern Oregon and uh, Southeastern Washington. Uh, and they basically covered this immense area. They're called flood basalts because they flooded the landscape. And um, many of the flows actually made it all the way to the coast. Um, and I mean, it's an immense area. It's also related to the Yellowstone hotspot. Um, there's it, the, the stuff about the Columbia River basalt just goes on and on and on. Um, it, 
this is 77,000 square miles in area and is a volume of 52,000 cubic miles. And I think I said this at an earlier talk, but it's the only way I can get my head around the whole volume thing is that, I mean, 52,000 cubic miles, what, what is that? And, and well, that in the Grand Canyon, the National Park Service has estimated the volume of air between the two rims to be about 1,000 cubic miles. So the Columbia River Basalt Group is more than 50 times the volume of air in the Grand Canyon. So there you go. But also, you know, it, it erupted between about 17, 17 to about 6 million years ago, the whole field, but 94% of that was by 14 and a half million years ago. So during that short period of time, it was a really active area with a lot of lava flows. And you can see all sorts of features in the Columbia Gorge that are related to the um, um, Columbia River Basalt Group. This is here in you know, Multnomah Falls. It, it drops, it's the tallest waterfall in, in Oregon. It drops over 600 feet over flows of the um, Grand Ronde Basalt, which is the biggest, the thickest unit, most voluminous of all the Columbia River Basalt Group. And here it's over 600 feet thick. And uh, there's multiple lava flows. I think that's the base of one right there. And there's a base of another up here. You can actually pick out, I think you can pick out like four different lava flows, but um, the folks who've done the geochemistry and all that have figured out there's actually five here. Um, if you look at this one up here, it looks kind of rubbly. And it's actually these circular things are pillows. So it's one of the things that we know that these, Lava flows, they flow down an existing valley. There are probably lakes and things like that. And so a lot of the lavas flowed into lakes. Um, if you go up to the Dalles, you can really see this. Um, this is um, right at the intersection of US 197 and 30. And I mean, it's five minutes off the interstate. Nobody has an excuse to not stop here. And you know, I've I've gone here and there haven't been any other people looking at it. It's just amazing to me. They're probably looking at flowers or something. But <laughs> anyway, excuse me. Um, so you can see the pillows and there's all this brown stuff. This is pelagonite, which is basically altered volcanic glass when the stuff is, you know, the lava flow is it's 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 flowing and it's always creating glass as it flows because it's the some of the the lava is chilling really rapidly and then that stuff is it flows into the water it reacts and it makes this stuff pelagonite but what's really cool is that this these pillows they grade upwards into this colonnade now the colonnade forms on land so this is one flow where i mean it flowed into a lake but it filled up the lake and then it, the lava kept flowing over the lake. It's just amazing. Okay, I guess I didn't need to tell you it was amazing. Um, so here, it, this is also, I really like this picture because I took it out of my car. Um, this is on the Washington side, right at milepost 57. And as you're looking at Mitchell Point and um, at Mitchell Point, you've got Grand Ronde Basalt down low and you've got Saddle Mountains basalt up here, which um, is one of the, it's the youngest unit of the um, um, Columbia River basalt. And there actually is Wanapum basalt in there, which you see on top the Grand Ronde, but I'll get to that in a minute. So here's a, a better picture of it from actually the pullout when you go to Mitchell Point. Um, and so you know that this slope here has got to be older than 12 million years old and younger than 15.6. And you can see these rocks up here, they look a little different. Well, these things are gravels. These are river gravels, um, presumably by the Columbia River um, that must be older than 12 million years old. And what's more, if you get kind of a different angle and look up there, you can see the Wanapum basalt and these gravels are deposited right against the Wanapum basalt. So this is an old edge of a canyon that these river gravels are deposited against. So this tells you some cool things. You see, first off, these gravels 
directly demonstrate the antiquity of the Columbia River, um, but also the fact that they were deposited in this canyon suggests that there was some uplift prior to their deposition, um, prior to 12 million years ago, to, to allow that kind of erosion to make that deep of a canyon. Okay, now here's a view looking up the gorge from, um, I always forget the name of this point. Cape Horn. Cape Horn, thank you. Um, God, it, I tell you, I never can remember it except if I'm like practicing this talk on my own. Um, and you can look up the river as far as there's Beacon Rock. And you can really see here how asymmetric the, the, the Columbia Gorge is. It's really steep on the Oregon side. And it's really quite gentle for much of the the Washington side. And that's because of these big landslides. Um, you're actually looking at one of them right here. This is the Skamania landslide. This is the, the head scarp for the Skamania landslide. It goes all the way along here. The, the landslide almost makes it to Beacon Rock, actually. This rock out here is part of the landslide. You can drive through here, and there are these big road cuts that I thought was bedrock until I learned I was actually in a landslide. So these, these big road cuts are actually transported blocks as well. And so the reason you have these big landslides on preferentially on the Washington side is because through this stretch of the gorge, the rocks are dipping gently to the south. And so that allows things to slide down towards the river. On the south side, on the Oregon side, there's nowhere for them to slide. So you can get some landslides, you certainly do, uh, but they're not nearly as big as, as the landslides on the Washington side. And that effect is compounded by the fact that the rocks on the Columbia River basalt here in brown has lots of fractures. It allows water to percolate downwards uh, into the lower rock, it gets into the Eagle Creek formation, which is very permeable. And so it soaks through that. And then it gets on top of this stuff, the Ohanapakash formation. And there's this um, ancient soil here that's really quite impermeable. Um, and so the water pools there, and it, it has this buoying effect that uh, enhances the, the, the landsliding. And so you, you just tend to get big landslides coming down towards the Columbia River. And here's a view from up on Beacon Rock. You can see um, the gentle dip here, the Eagle Creek formation. And, and so the things are all dipping gently to the south. And here's a little bit of a picture of the Eagle Creek formation. You can just get a sense how permeable it must be. Um, and, but also these are Lahar deposits of um, the, it's about 20, 22 million years old, I think. So these are like, older Cascade volcanoes. And the Ohana Pakash underneath it gets as old as, as I think it's about 35 or 36 million years ago. So these are really the oldest volcanic representations we have of today's volcanic uh, arc. Here's a view looking at the Bonneville landslide. There's the Bonneville Dam. Uh, here's the little town of Cascade Locks and the Bridge of the Gods that you can um, drive across. Um, and you can see the Bonneville landslide here. This is only about 600 years old. And um, you can see that it moved the channel of the, the river to the south a little bit. It actually dammed the river so you could walk across it 600 years ago, which created this, the, the legend of the Bridge of the Gods. It caused, because it blocked the river, it caused it to back up all the way, I believe, to the uh, Tri-Cities area. Um, and well, that was this big lake, which eventually broke through the, the, the dam to, to the landslide and flooded down river. It would have flooded downtown Portland to a depth of about 20 feet. Um, so big flood about 600 years ago, but nothing compared to the ice age floods, many of which were spawned from Glacial Lake Missoula. And I really like this picture because this is, you know, um, uh, uh, Crown Point. Thank you, Crown Point <laughs> and Vista House, um, because the largest of the Columbia or the Missoula floods 
uh, the maximum flood crest was nearly 100 feet above Vista House. So just imagine all that water coming down. And um, a Scott's book, uh, The Cataclysms on the Columbia, really beautifully describes so much of these, um, these Ice Age floods. Um, so Scott, feel free to chime in, like I said. Um, but the- um, You're doing great. Oh, <laughs> thanks coach. Um, so, um, but, but just if you're not familiar with, with the, the Missoula floods, um, it's a really cool story because during the, um, the end of the, the, the Pleistocene, during the end of the Ice Age, you've got the, 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 the um, Cordilleran ice sheet is, you know, is impinged on um, across what is into what is now the United States. And you've got all these big lobes. And this one lobe here, um, I guess this is the Purcell lobe, it, 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 it reached down into Idaho and it blocked the Clark Fork, which was a river well, which is a river that drains northwestern um, Montana, and it caused it to back up into this giant lake called Glacial Lake Missoula. And I mean, you, you can see the lake, and you can see just how big it was. If you look at the scale here, this is over. This is a hundred miles to Missoula, and it then extends farther down the Bitterroot Valley. But to really get an idea how big this lake was, here's a picture in Missoula, Montana. And these strand lines from the lake reach up over a thousand feet above the valley floor. So this lake, a hundred miles away from where it's being blocked, was a thousand feet deep at least. So eventually it broke through the ice, caused this massive flood that coursed down through the in northeastern Washington, carved out the channeled scablands, got into the, the Columbia River. Um, basin, depending on which flood you're talking about, one of them actually came all the way down. Um, and in, there are a couple of places where there's constrictions in the channel, uh, where it backed up here, it backed up all the way to um, almost to Yakima. It backed up when it reached the, the, the sort of the mouth, if you will, of the Columbia Gorge. And here at Kalama Gap, it backed up all the way um, back to Eugene. Um, and these floods occurred repeatedly. Um, I've heard estimates between um, 40 and some people I think argue for more than 100 floods that took place between about 18,000 and about 15,000 years ago. And so what would happen is, you know, that the ice would block the river, cause this big lake to form, it would break through, drain the lake, and then the ice would advance again. So this took place repeatedly. And then finally, as the, the glaciers were sort of less robust and they were more in retreat, uh, it just stopped happening. As you can see a lot of features, Scablands, um, one of my favorites, this is up near uh, the Dalles where, I mean, you can imagine these floods going over the landscape, tearing up all the topsoil, tearing up a lot of the bedrock and then just leaving behind these scabs um, here's some, if you drive up the gorge, just really start developing an eye for the, the scab lands. Um, even Beacon Rock here was, uh, I mean, it's 57,000 years old and it's just this volcanic neck. So where did the rest of the volcano go? It was pretty much eroded away by these floods. Uh, and then there's the deposits. This is about 30 feet from here up to there. So these big coarse flood deposits you can see in a lot of the side canyons of the gorge deposited by uh, the, 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 the Missoula floods. And these things are in, um, you know, now they're mined for gravel and things like that. They're, they make a, <clears throat> they're the main aquifer in Spokane. So they make for a great aquifer. So these things have been pretty important to us today. Okay, so with the Columbia Gorge, you can, you know, you've got all these different rock types, you can create a uh, little cross section here that kind of outlines the story, starting with the oldest volcanic rocks. And here's the Columbia River basalt and brown and the boring volcanics and modern cascades and so on. Landslides and um, here coming down off the um, hillside. Um, and, and, you know, you can see that the volcanic activity had to go back a, a long time, um, just based on the rock record that the Columbia River had to date back at least 12 million years. Um, the bedrock structure controls the shape of the gorge. 
And of course, there's a lot of um, cool stuff to see from the, the Ice Age floods. <clears throat> but if you compare this to the sort of cross section across all of Oregon, you can really kind of get a little bit of perspective here because for one thing, you know, we've got this whole story based on just what's in the Columbia Gorge, but there's so much more. I mean, you can, the Columbia Gorge doesn't even have, it's just this area right up here. It doesn't even have any accreted terrains exposed. Uh, and the cover stuff that itself has its own story, it continues on and on and on in, in both directions. And, and so that's, I think just, you know, it just gets more interesting and the more you learn about it. And, and to kind of make this point, here's Crater Lake, um, which, you know, is one of the world's deepest lakes. I think it's the seventh deepest lake in the world. It's almost 2000 feet deep. It's incredibly clear. Um, it's, uh, it formed when Mount Mazama, which was a sort of a typical cascade volcano, erupted some 7,700 years ago in such a large eruption that it collapsed downwards into its magma chamber and created this big hole. And later there was, there were more, there was more volcanic activity creating Wizard Island here, which itself is quite an impressive volcano. I mean, think of how deep the lake is. It goes down um, pretty deep, the volcano. Um, <clears throat> then it filled with water. It's, our national park. And if you spend time here, you can wander around and really get to know it intimately. You could learn more about its geologic history that Mount Mazama that it itself dates back a little, you know, about 400,000 years ago. I believe Mount Scott here is a satellite cone that's 420,000 years old. There's beheaded glacial valleys here. You learn all sorts of cool stuff. But that's one volcano in the Cascade Range. And here that's represented just by this little triangle on the diagram. So really it goes on and on. And these stories just get infinitely more interesting the more you learn about it. And for me, that's the greatest thing I think about geology because those stories, the more you learn about it, the more they, they go on. So thank you very much. Oh, lights. Oh, I just pressed all on. Now we're in trouble. <sighs> that one, yeah. Protector. Oh, that turned. How's that? Hey, that's good. Hey, <laughs> we locked out. Okay. Three, four, six, yeah. I see that the law intrusions happening. Uh, oh, right here. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you have to do that? Thing? Okay, Where so these are, th this is a diagrammatic cross section. So, uh, don't use this as a map to navigate by, but it's schematic. <laughs> um, this would represent the boring volcanics, um, I think. So, this re actually represents um, <coughs> some of the, um, it, the, on the east side of the Willamette Valley and including, say, um, uh, Spencer Butte and Skinner Butte down near Eugene, these are these um, basaltic intrusions that are uh, like 32 million years old. So that's what this represents. So this predates much of the modern, it certainly predates the modern Cascades, but it's somewhat contemporaneous with the Western Cascades, which is what this represents. This represents a uh, still older um, gabbroic and basaltic um, intrusions that we see in the uh, coast range, like Mary's Peak. Um, and a lot of, if you've been to Kentucky Falls, for example, that flows over a body of, uh, a lot of the waterfalls in the, in the coast range flow over these uh, intrusive um, um, basaltic intrusions. And so they're more resistant, so they, they hold up the waterfalls. And, and can I ask you to repeat the questions oh. that come oh, yes. for Thank these you. folks? Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. So that question, I guess I could repeat it after the- Don't, don't repeat okay. the whole thing, but just in the future. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry, that was my fault. 
Yes. Yeah, so uh, the Columbia River flows through the middle of the Cascade Volcanic Arc. Uh, my understanding it's the only place in the world where a major river flows through the middle of the uh, Volcanic Arc. Is that true? You know, I've, I, the question is, is it true that the Columbia River, because it, it, it's the only river, the only major river that flows across the Volcanic Arc in, on the, in the world, um, I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that also. And I think I heard it from a reliable source and I certainly couldn't tell you another one. Um, so it might be, there's, um, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of active tectonism going on here, but I think in a lot of volcanic arcs, there is a lot of active tectonism. So um, I'm not sure exactly why, um, except probably a lot of it has to do with the, the folding that, that um, we might see that's broadly related to the Yakima fold belt. Okay, good. And we can take one or two. Yeah. Um, Charlie uh, has a question if you want to unmute and ask. Good to hear me, Charlie. Oh, hello. Okay. Uh, sorry. sorry. Um, you have all these accreted terrains. Uh, what old volcanics are visible there? In the, so in the in the accreted terrains, they are um, largely volcanic. They're they're all oceanic in their origin. Um, and so a number of them, like the Wallawa terrain, is a, a volcanic arc. Um, the uh, Baker terrain is sort of an old subduction complex, which has a lot of um, volcanic material in it. Certainly Siletia is volcanic. It was an oceanic plateau. Um, you know, we've got a lot of sort of volcanic arcs in the Cascades. So the, the, the um, accreted terrains are by and large, um, a lot of them are volcanic in origin. Okay. Okay, and we can take one more from that audience and then we need to, and then we need to be done. Yeah, I think there's one, one more from uh, Wes. Do you want to go ahead and unmute? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me okay? okay. Yes. Okay. okay, so I've always been fascinated and mystified by when the CRBs hit the Portland area, they seem to have gone underground under the West Hills and, and then popped up along the coast and, and created Saddle Mountain near Astoria. I, I just don't understand how basalt could just create its own river underground and then pop up so far away on the coast. Oh, I think it's pretty continuous. Um, I, I take it everybody heard the question here. Um, so if you if you just look at a geologic map, there's, there's bits of um, Columbia River basalt basically following the Columbia River um, all the way out, um, almost all the way out to Astoria. Um, I know like Sadie, uh, not Sadie, Sobe Island, um, that lighthouse at the end is perched on Columbia River basalt. If you go past that, past Scapus, the cliffs along there are Columbia River basalt. Um, at Rainier, that's Columbia River basalt, I'm pretty sure. Um, and also um, a lot of the Tualatin Hills are Columbia River basalt. And, and so as far as the, um, you know, I, I, I need to look at a map, but I think if you look at a geologic map, you'll see that they're actually, they've been mapped out as pretty continuous. Deformed since they were deposited. And they've been deformed, yeah, thanks. Um, like, you know, the Portland Hills Fault cuts them off here at the edge of Portland. Um, and then there's like this big broad fold in the Tualatin Hills. But did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. but there's some, there's some of those sea stacks like Canada, the, the Haystack Rock and further down the coast, which is quite a ways away from the oh, Columbia yeah. River Channel. Well, it's really somewhat mystifying when you get all the way down to like Newport, um, Newport, all the way down to Seal Rock. And also along the coast, there are a lot of invasive basalts. 
um, that have intruded into the sedimentary sequence. So that's a whole nother story. But uh, the ones that are farther south, I think most people argue that they, um, that at one time there were flows that basically headed more southward, that the same flows that you can see at Silver Falls State Park, uh, and then down near Salem, and they flowed out to the coast. But since then, the coast range has uplifted, and those things have been eroded off the top of the coast range. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I never realized that the coast range was maybe younger than these. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's excellent. pretty young. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, thank you all.